received a drowning of religious careers and was followed by resurrection into a, a pastoral vocation. We become what we are called to be, and we become what we are called to be by praying. And we start out by praying from the belly of the fish. So what I'd like to do is open tonight with prayer. Be wise. Um, let us pray. Grant, O oh God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear and hatred cease, and that our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Miguel, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Yep. A few thoughts to begin with before we introduce the panel. Um, let's acknowledge that this is a tough topic. You know, while it's tough, it doesn't mean we can't also have some fun tonight and also maybe laugh. But um, it's not an easy one. It's tough because you know it deals with failure. Dioceses don't want failure. Parishes don't want it. Uh, clergy do not pursue a call to ministry to have it fail. But yet, it does happen. Um, and when it does, and I think this is why we're even having this conversation, it's often kept silent. Uh, it can be very painful. And it can be very expensive. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that tonight, you know, our panel does not have all the answers. In fact, we're really just beginning to, to name the elephant in the room. Um, each on the panel, though, wrote last fall as part of a larger essay campaign uh, to give voice and explore the challenge of such calls in a non-reactive way. Currently, there are no identified best practices for how to better address calls that fail that are not due to criminal or moral crimes. Um, we have actually a pretty good system for if someone does go down that road, we have a good process. But the problem is when someone isn't in that process, how do we identify that and how do we um, build the, the vocations that are there? What we wonder um, is can we cast a failure into a new light? Uh, not as an end to ministry, uh, but potentially as a means for transformation. So ultimately, we are exploring this tough, tough topic to support better relationships, to build the body of Christ, uh, to develop more equitable arrangements for clergy and parishes and dioceses, and to build legitimacy and resources in order to build credibility to a topic that is often kept silent. Um, so we're trying to find ways to support both clergy and congregations to live further into their vocation. So we'll, we'll sort of begin in just a second, um, just so you have a guide for how this evening will we'll try to go. You know, each on the panel will introduce themselves and uh, answer an identical question. Um, we'll then return to each of them to go a little deeper to explore some of the themes they raised in their essays. Um, and we hope we have a, a chunk of time at the end um, you know, that might be open for questions, and Miguel and Brendan will be sort of our eyes in the sky. Um, it might turn out that questions might be good following a, a, a deeper presentation uh, due to a exploration of a particular topic, or hopefully at the end we'll have an opportunity for anybody and all to, to raise questions so we can have some discussion along the way. So I guess I'd like to start. Um, Bonnie, uh, I'd like to, if you would begin, if you'd introduce yourself and question at hand, which everyone's going to be asked, is, you know, what is it about this situation uh, or the situations of challenging calls that, that motivates you to get involved in this way? Okay. And if I, could just, if I could just interrupt just real quickly, I'm sorry, yeah. two te technical notes. Um, uh, Scott, um, for some reason your camera is off, so if you could turn on your camera. And then secondly, just wanted to note for everyone here, um, ECF t uh, has a practice of recording our webinars. So just bear that in mind in terms of uh, um, all of our comments. So, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Bonnie Anderson. I'm from the Diocese of Michigan. I'm a lay person. And um, why I'm interested in this is I think that the lay people can play an important role in this situation, um, not jumping into um, onto a bandwagon of um, for a clergy person, but helping to be what our call is, and that is to be, um, to be faithful, to reconcile the world, and to start in our own parishes with that kind of reconciliation. So I think the lay people have an important role here, um, not to um, not exacerbate a situation, but to try to um, mitigate and use their 
own authority and power to assist the clergy and, and assist the congregation to move forward together. Thank you, Bonnie. I, I, I thank you. Uh, Dennis, uh, what is it about this situation or uh, situations of challenging calls which has gotten you sort of involved going down this road? Well, after 45 years almost of uh, ordained ministry, I retired uh, in 2008 from the Diocese of Texas. I leave retirement in uh, Western North Carolina and Asheville. I'm licensed here and do some consulting work with parishes. And throughout my ministry, I have watched time and time again really wonderful, competent, capable people in very, very tough situations, finding themselves describing their situations as very isolated, lonely, uh, feeling that there is no one there being with them or supporting them. And as the years go on, I find that not only from colleagues and respected and esteemed friends, but people of various denominations, other clergy outside the Episcopal Church, it's not unique to us that it seems that the higher levels that clergy are leaving the ordained ministry, many for reasons I think that have they the proper support and encouragement and transformational support that that ministry would not necessarily necessarily have to go in another totally different direction, uh, leaving, leaving uh, active parish ministry. So I'm very concerned about how we care for colleagues and people within our church family as we uh, struggle with this and uh, issue uh, difficult calls and also so even the cases where people are in it have created their own really messes in a way through moral lapses and, and uh, bad behavior. Even so, pastorally, we have a responsibility to be there to support them and care for them through that. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, uh, Dennis, uh, I'm excuse me, Donald, um, you know, what is it about this situation, challenging calls that, that sort of got you involved? Well, um, Thank you, and thank you for um, for putting this together, Scott, and uh, and helping us raise this very important topic. I'm president of the Episcopal Church Foundation for the the last ten years, and prior to that, I was uh, an active layperson at at various levels of the church, diocesan and congregational, and I was senior warden during two transitions, and. And obviously, uh, from an organizational point of view, we're really concerned about uh, leadership development, the idea of forging effective lay clergy partnerships and helping people have access to uh, resources they need to engage in mission and ministry. And I interestingly, uh, over the last couple years, I've probably gotten uh, several calls from various clergy who have been involved in these difficult calls often led to forced resignations or terminations. I also had a, a personal experience in my own congregation of, of, of that congregation. And I started saying, you know, what is wrong with the system? Uh, what, what can I do as an individual layperson and what can ECF do as an organization uh, to kind of maybe provide some tools or resources or ideas uh, to address this issue. And uh, what we found is that there's not a lot out there. Uh, uh, you know, as Scott said, we, we can deal with these situations. We're talking about, you know, major high crimes and misdemeanors. When we're talking about conflict that's out of hand or um, a disagreement over leadership style or the inability to help people work together, uh, we're, we're kind of at end. So uh, I'm really pleased that, that we're, we're having this conversation in a candid, frank, prayerful, and thoughtful way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David, and to you, uh, you know, what, what interested you got you involved uh, in this step? Well, I I very much appreciate the, the invitation to um, become involved with this, um, and part of um, part of my interest in this relates to the work that I do with uh, seminarians, 
Uh, I'm a professor at Virginia Theological Seminary, and I also direct our Doctor of Ministry program and work with our uh, recent graduates who are in a program of continuing development after graduation. So I hear some of the early call uh, difficulties and frustrations, and I hear some of the later uh, difficulties and frustrations and, um, and challenges. And one of the common uh, experiences I hear from people is a kind of deer-in-the-headlights moment. What just happened? And how did this happen? And then the questions that follow from that. What led up to this? How did this, uh, how did this come to be? Um, so that's one thing that interests me, is, is inquiring beneath the surface of the moment that hits us in the face. Uh, it's like, well, what else, what else was going on behind the scenes that we didn't notice before? How can we learn, use this as a learning moment? Um, um, the other thing that strikes me in, in all of this is uh, the, the tendency to pretend that it's not there um, can then create the very situation of eruption later on because we have both as clergy and as lay people participated in a kind of mutual designed blindness to something going on in our communities we don't want to talk about and that's part of what is of key interest to me about when things go wrong Thank you. And I think it was interesting that the panel has all come in at sort of different angles, and it's been interesting to, to sort of see people to describe the elephant a little bit. Donald, um, you know, your essay talked a lot about training and development. I'm going to read a scenario that you kind of began with. You know, in your essay, uh, you lay out a scenario that seems to underline difficult calls. You know, in it, you highlight that an interval makes a significant change to Christ's church anytime. As best background to that, you share that the congregation of maybe 75 or so may be struggling financially. It wishes to grow but does not know what that means and it's maybe about its own relevance. You then add an interesting dynamic and you share that this is probably done in a diocese itself maybe struggling with finances, which, which may be led by a bishop who avoids conflict at all costs. Now obviously in your essay it's a civilization, um, but it notes the three key points on the country to be present and challenges the diocese and, and clergy and, and parish. I'd like to ask, you know, to what extent do you think that conflict between clergy and congregation are rooted in leading to change? You know, and, 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 I, and I use the scenario in my essay because I, I think it's fairly typical. And when you kind of delve into some of these issues, the con Conflict often occurs as a result of the pressure on the person kind of to do something differently. Uh, because, you know, we, we, you know, we, we keep as, as members of congregations, as, as, uh, as uh, uh, constituents of various organizations, we keep talking about the fact that, you know, the church has to change, we need to do things differently. Uh, but when it happens, uh, we're resistant. And it's like, uh, and, and so what, what often happens in, in, in the scenario is that, uh, that, you know, it's often a time of stress, you know, we're declining membership or declining resources, and the leadership of the congregation expects the clergy to do something. And often it's something as simple or seemingly simple as, uh, you know, changing a service time or introducing a, uh, can a you know, a new group that you <coughs> facility or, or, uh, or often in times of declining resources having to reduce the full-time music director or, or uh, eliminate full-time administrative support program and all hell breaks loose. Mm. And uh, what often happens at that point is uh, while, the, while the person is, is trying to, you know, make changes or, 
or do things that he or she feels is necessary to keep the congregation viable or to move in a new direction, often uh, because lay people feel either different from the decision-making process or not understanding the decision-making process, uh, the, con the conflict blows out of proportion. And in the Episcopal Church, we, we deal with conflict in three ways. We either ignore it, we blow it out of proportion, or what we love to do is deal with it in passively aggressive ways. And then, then the process begins, and, and it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it gets to the point where there are resources available to kind of turn that situation around. How, I mean, you, you've alluded to it a little bit, but, you know, what, in these types of situations when they, when they sort of uh, blow out of control or even before, you know, what do you see as the bishop or the diocese role in supporting congregations that are in those types of states of serious conflict? Well, well, well quite frankly, I think most bishops do not have the, the skill sets or the wherewithal to deal with conflict. And, and well, you know, the, then the typical example is, you know, sending a consultant. So, you know, and it may be someone who actually has uh, skills and training in conflict resolution, but often it's kind of, you know, the group of, you know, well-loved, underpaid consultants that bishops send to congregations to deal with searches or vestry retreats. Uh, and, and, and often, if, if you're not trained or savvy or know how to deal with these situations, uh, that could further exacerbate the situation. Uh, or the other thing the bishops will often do, then, then they'll come to the congregation and they'll kind of say, okay, I'm here, I'm your pastor, you know, kind of bear your souls, tell me all the problems and issues and concerns you have. And so it becomes like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission type of event and everyone kind of bears their soul, and every conceivable problem they've had with the director or each other comes out, and there's no way to put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, so I, I think what, what, what the, and, and ultimately, you know, while, you know, consultants and trained people, it, it's important that they're available as resources, ultimately the rector, the clergy person, the congregation, look to the bishop himself or herself to help resolve the issue. Because time when we really need the people at the top to kind of be
person in the congregation, I therefore think any of our clergy deserve to have first class follow up. Their family deserves it. And building on what Donald said, there, there's the, the dynamic also of the parish. And so you know, I, the fact is that all of those, the parishes, the parishioners are involved, and their uh, the clergy themselves can be devastated and feeling totally out there by themselves. Um, and they don't want to go to their bishop because they feel like the bishop's just simply going to further judge them or add further criticism to their difficult circumstances. Um, so all of that, our own personal competitiveness and uh, the issues around our sensitivities and our feeling of worthlessness, uh, when people become depressed, they tend to disconnect from the very relationships they need. Uh, and often, as I hear it, their spiritual lives fall apart and they disconnect from their prayer lives and it really becomes a very lonely and, and a very, very painful place. You, you suggest a model uh, for pastoral care of clergy who come through serious conflict. Can you speak about that model and Uh, sure. Um, I, I, one of the things that I found was from Lutheran but they we just pause for a second. Um, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties. Um, can uh, those the those um, who are uh, pan um, if you're using a phone, can you just mute your phone so we can eliminate some of the echo in the background? <clears throat> yeah, well, yeah, Dennis, let me ask that question again because I, I wasn't very clear there. Um, you suggest a model pastoral who have come through serious conflict. You know, can you speak about that model and why it may fit as a best practice to think about? And sorry for the interruption. That's all right. I, uh, I think that one of the resources that I really was impressed with was a, a Lutheran model that existed in a, a, a roughly contiguous with the Diocese of Texas. And uh, there was a practice of a corps of chaplains that were trained and that they were assigned uh, to persons that were experiencing difficulty, either in difficult context of the parish or in disciplinary themselves contribute in significant ways to the problems. But in any case, Kaplan was a second, and they came from a core of voluntary trained folk out of that jurisdiction they had a specific contract for permitted them to have a relationship with the pastor they were assigned to as it Total confidentiality would not be breached. Uh, and I believe that it would be very important that there's going to be any real support for, for clergy in tough situations is that they are going to, I think, be very confident that the relationship they have would be one that would allow uh, true support and respect without any of what they might share within the context of that relationship. So to have all of the sanctity uh, of a confessional, if you will. So I think it's also important that probably the clergy have an opportunity to participate in selecting who that chaplain would be. But there would need to be a core of leaders who were trained and who agreed that they would abide by a mutually established contract that would respect the their time, their effort, their consulting work, and support for clergy. There may be two or three that might go, one for family, the spouse and family, uh, the other for the walking, particularly with the, the priest who's directly involved in the conflict, then uh, someone that would go in and be pastor to the congregation and uh, help them, even confront them as necessary in all three cases, the, the pastor, the family, or the, the, the congregation as needed, but as well to love them and walk with them throughout that process. Does that individual uh, 
in what you're thinking of in, in an ECLA model um, as a potential best practice. I mean, is there any advocacy that goes along with that? How, how does, or, or how does confidentiality play into that? Um, can we just touch or, or go a little deeper with that? Yeah, I, the the role is certainly that of the of this primary pastor, but also advocate to to listen to, to hear, to share, uh, to try to bring balance uh, in context and and some real and personal encouragement to the life of the person, as well as helping them discover insight. I wouldn't suggest that this is going to replace possible counseling by a professional counselor as a person or through and try to get to get a deep in, a deeper insights about themselves as to how they handle the situation. I think what Donald said, certainly you want to get uh, clergy that will learn from this experience, make it transformational, make it a positive outcome rather than, well, you're a failure, you're a reject, you might as well leave, there's the door, don't let it hit you on the way out. But it may require some professional counseling, but I really would like to see somebody in the clergy's camp that's really there without any other agenda other than being there really to know and walk with and support and pray with and, and help spiritual guide. I mean, I would do that and have to, with my parishioners, parishioners in the jail, I have parishioners that committed murder, and, you know, we're there regardless uh, for them, for family. So I think that the clergy deserve the same. And it's sad when you hear families saying, I've never felt so isolated, abandoned, and left to hang out that, as I have by the church as a professional within the church. And that to me is very simple. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Bonnie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears here. Um, you know, your essay spoke a lot, uh, not much about clergy, but about, about parishes and, and parish dynamics. And um, in particular, you, you focused on the role of patriarchs and, and other leaders in the midst of these situations. You know, in your essay, uh, you turn the crystal on the issue by focusing on parishes and parish leadership. And you begin uh, your essay with a quote from uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, which reads, you know, our lives begin to end the day we keep silent about things that matter. You know, in light of the topic in the essay, why start there? Well, I think that all of us um, here have been in congregations where there are recognizable um, lay leaders. And I wonder how... Um, I wonder how accessible the lay leaders are to the clergy when these situations arise. And I mean actually being advocates, advocates for the clergy. Um, when, let's see, I was taking some notes a few minutes ago, and um, let me look here. Dennis, when you alluded to, um, to the sensitivity that you talked about that, that are um, present with regards to the clergy and the clergy family, um, I think those are heartbreaking situations. And uh, as a layperson, my family and I have um, invited, welcomed clergy into our lives at our most vulnerable times. Um, when there's death, when we're sick, when we're, there's problems, um, and we go to the clergy person to, uh, as a friend to help us and to um, <clears throat> to give us advice. And I think it's very difficult for clergy to be vulnerable to, to the parish, to, to people, to the, to the lay people in the parish, because there's this, um, this kind of setup that they're supposed to have all the answers, they're supposed to be all powerful, um, they're supposed to um, help everybody else and forget about themselves. And I do think that um, the clergy could, um, could go a long way by practicing small steps of vulnerability early on in their ministry, in their congregation. I'm not saying huge risk, but just small steps of um, giving the parish some insight into the fact that they're also very human. And it seems to me that um, the lay people have a responsibility not to jump on some bandwagon of abuse and assault on clergy people, but to um, be advocates for them. And it seems to me like we're missing the boat in that. That's our job. Our job is to, um, is to support each other in the church. 
and I think we forget about doing that. I also believe that um, these little steps that the clergy can take um, need to identify early on in their ministry. And I, I think it was David, you might have mentioned about the, the time of the call, and maybe it was Donald, I'm sorry, about the time of the call. Clarity with regards to the call is extremely important. What do you expect, congregation, of um, the person that you're calling? And have you talked with them about it? And are they comfortable with it? Clarity is very, very key. That basic dynamic about clarity and expectation, that can be the beginning of a great relationship. And it can also be the beginning of a lot of trouble if those expectations aren't clear. And I also think some early warning signs that we might need to identify, um, maybe a list a list of early warning signs that says, uh-oh, we need to back up a little bit here and we need to figure out what's going on. What are the symptoms? Um, someone talked about avoidance. Um, someone talked about um, the fact that that adds to an ultimate eruption. Where are Where is the communication in these situations? Um, are we clear about what we're saying to each other and what we expect from each other? Do we have any analytical skills? And can we agree that we want to solve this together? Would that be a, a beginning thing that we might want to talk about in these kinds of situations? This is something that we'd like to solve together and not have, um, not damage each other with. And I think for me that goes back to a basic, um, basic thought that I have about the church, and that is that we really don't have any common language for telling the truth to each other. That we, um, that we avoid telling the truth, if it's difficult truth to tell and hear, we rarely do that until it's time to erupt. So we need to develop a common language for telling the truth to each other and to listening. We need to develop analytical skills. We need to understand what our role is in the church. It's right out there in the prayer book, what we're supposed to do. What's the role of the clergy? What's the role of the lay people? What's the role of the bishop? Let's do that stuff and not get all hung up in our power and authority of telling each other what to do and trying to make somebody else feel bad. It's just so heartbreaking to hear these kinds of things. You know, in your essay, you highlight particular uh, lady who, who sometimes are described as patriarchs, people who uh, may not have role authority, but who have informal authority, who are known and respected and cared for. Can you talk a little bit about them and what maybe their role is when they, they might intuitively know, see some of the signals of conflict growing and, and developing? What are some things that they might do in these situations? Uh, to sure. sure. I think I alluded to, um, to a well-known um, gone home. Uh, she was a, a matriarch. In, in the diocese and in her parish. And um, when, when Mary saw, and I've seen a lot of people like this, when Mary saw any kind of potential, um, potential blow up, and this wasn't avoidance, she was very good at, at confronting things, but any kind of potential blow up, she would invite people over to her house, including the clergy person. And they would sit down and they'd have a meal together that Mary cooked. She was a great cook. And they'd sit there and talk about each other, with each other, about as, they're, as people. How are your kids? Um, how are your parents doing? What have you been doing lately? Um, how do you feel about the parish? What are some things that I can do to help you? Um, those kinds of early on um, steps that a person who is wise and um, kind can take in a congregation. And there are people like that in every congregation. It's just um, sometimes they need some encouragement to step forward and do something. So that's, that's really what I'm, what I'm talking about. It sounds simple, um, but I don't think it really is. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some key? behavioral elements the lady should possess in order to be effective leaders in assisting the congregation to resolve potential explosive and hurtful situations of the clergy. I mean, you tell a story about this wonderful matriarch 
can you identify some things that other lady can can do in this situation? Scott, you kind of broke up when you were talking about hear your whole question. I'm sorry. What are some key behavioral elements that lady lady should possess in order to be effective leaders uh, to help resolve conflict as it arises? Could you hear me there? Yes, thank you. I think it's the same kind of qualities that clergy should have, and that is what I talked about earlier with regards to um, being clear about what you're hoping for, being able to articulate what you think um, in a clear, kind way, um, asking for forgiveness if you hurt someone, setting that kind of a, of a, um, that kind of a norm that it's okay to admit mistakes, to say you're sorry, to, um, to make amends. Um, it seems pretty um, straightforward to me. And I, I think we get into a, into a system of conflict, aggression, who's going to win. It becomes a win-lose sort of situation. And I think that's, um, I think that's what we're meant to do. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, if I could just in, in interject before going on to David. Sure. Um, first of all, to note the time that we're about 15 minutes out. And then secondly, um, secondly, you know, there's been there's some conversation in the chat box uh, that's taking place that's really, really, I think, significant. One is just about, you know, we've heard a lot about pastoral care to clergy, but what about pastoral care, uh, detached pastoral care to lay leaders who are also going through this um, as a way of helping this not go um, add fuel to the fire? And perhaps David can um, be one of the people who addresses this as well. But um, anyway, just want to note that that conversation is taking place in the chat box as well as a few other questions. Are you suggesting that we address that, or you just want us to note it? I guess a note, <laughs> and then I mean I, I I want to recognize that David has not yet spoken, uh, okay. so okay. want to make sure that David does go ahead and do that. Yeah. Well, I, I think and the, he does in his essay talk about systems, very, which is great. And so, if David wants to sort of jump to you, you know, um, in your essay you talk about the ways that acquiescent avoidance and overarching interest in in warmth in a congregation can pave the way for 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 bullying and abusive behavior to emerge. You know, can you say more about that? Or, or maybe maybe start with Miguel raises uh, and, and you choose. And David, I think you're on mute. Sorry. There we are. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Part of the issue that I was trying to deal with in my essay was the predecessors of conflict and what sets up the scenario in which conflict can emerge, but more importantly, in which bullying or abusive behavior or manipulation can begin to emerge. And uh, I, I drew from the, the Nathan Network uh, model uh, that abuse is, in a way, the result of a perfect storm of the meeting of perpetrator victim and a situation that permits or allows or creates the space in which the abuse can occur. And in this case, uh, there's a way of thinking of congregational system with this lens, that there are people in any system that scan the environment and look for signs of um, potential weakness or potential permission to begin to insert more power and seize power and wield power over others. And then there are those, many of us, who are not aware that we might actually be acquiescing or giving away power by not addressing certain issues when they uh, present themselves or by permitting things that go left, uh, that continue unsaid by a congregation or community to continue to be unsaid and unaddressed. One of the things that can be a particular barrier for us as Christians is that we're very excited by communities that are warm and welcoming and caring, 
and that can become our primary um, our primary motivation for getting involved with such a community. That can in, that can over influence the search process. Is this priest a warm and caring priest? Is this congregation a warm and caring congregation? And in the midst of scanning the environment for that, we we fail to pay as much attention as we might to whether or not this is an honest congregation or an honest priest, whether the questions can be asked and explored together and answered directly. And our failure to ask the troubling questions is related to our attachment to warmth as a primary goal of Christian community. Does that relate to maybe what Bonnie raised a little bit in, in, in both for clergy and for, for laity in, in some vulnerability um, and, and just to, you know, maybe step on each other's toes a little bit so that the connection and the trust is there? Yeah. Well, part vulnerability can be a kind of thing. One is to be able to state some things for myself of some anxieties or troubles or issues that I may not be very good at dealing with or that that are challenges for me. But the other is to ask the questions of the congregation and see how they respond, or for the congregation to be direct and ask the clergy uh, and see how they respond. How people respond gives one a signal of whether this is a good fit or not. And when we fail to ask those questions, we don't actually get the answers that we need, and then we then we find ourselves facing the problems down the road. Hmm. Now, can I address some of the question of the um, laity care, if you will? Please. Part of what I try to address in the essay is is not so much after the fact care, but the learning that can go on that can prevent the next situation, um, and that's related to both clergy and lay people. The ability to build those must for a kind of strong um, willingness and artful willingness to speak with honesty and love and to seek honest yet loving directness. And there's an artistry to that. You know, on one hand, one can gravitate toward a too really pastoral sensibility, uh, on the other hand, toward a too overly prophetic sensibility. Um, and, and somewhere navigating in the middle to say there are truths to be known and to be understood, let's find them together. Um, that's an art to develop. It's not something that's taught, and so it's not something that's easily learned. Um, there are people that, and there are groups that help us learn how to do this. I, I saw some thread about family systems um, theory, and, and that's been helpful to many to begin to go down this direction. Um, for lay people in a congregation, I think there's a book that's very helpful um, for developing tools and muscles for being what's called a third side in a conflict. That is, the people that aren't drawn into one or the other pole, but that form the container field and that can also help step in to prevent escalation. And so there are roles to investigate with that and help people explore how they can develop more strongly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, we went probably a little bit longer than what I imagined, but it, this has been Fantastic. Uh, Miguel, I'd like to turn it over to you, eyes in the sky, and, and you know, I think there's some questions out there uh, that maybe we start addressing. Sure. Um, I see I mean, Stu Wood has had oh, his... sorry. Um, and <laughs> Can I... Someone asked the question of the book. It's um, called The Third Side by Yuri, U-R-I, The Third Side. Um, I'm going to try, Stu, to you up and so that you can uh, speak just one second um, okay can you 
I can talk over the phone if that works. That mm. does work, yes. Thank okay, you. great. I, I simply want to report an experience that I think um, fits with what you've been uh, seeking to address tonight. Um, I participate in a, um, I guess you'd call it a small congregation uh, here in, in Vermont uh, that had a, a very painful dissolution of pastoral relationship um, now two and a half years ago. And uh, perhaps uh, just by God's grace, uh, we've got uh, at least four laypersons who are by vocation um, uh, psychiatric social workers or psychologists who are active doing therapy. And they, sensing the uh, difficulty the congregation was having, uh, Taking side, finding themselves taking sides and so forth, uh, crafted a series of listening opportunities uh, without taking a, a stance of uh, one side or the other or any side, uh, simply providing a safe place in which people could share what they were experiencing, not identifying who was at fault, but what they were experiencing. And doing that over a period of about four or five months, um, every six weeks, uh, I think were extraordinarily helpful in um, uh, addressing what had been very, very painful. And I think preparing the congregation to be much more sensitive to the kinds of pressures under which clergy function now um, so as to um, anticipate the arrival of our next uh, priest um, being sensitive to the issues that he or she may very well be functioning under and try to be um, sensitive to any signs that that Things aren't going as they ought uh, for, for either for lay people or for or for the priest. Uh, I think I want to stand with Bonnie, uh, with whom I've stood before, uh, that lay people have an enormous uh, opportunity to exercise reconciling ministry if we call them into that ministry. And, and and let them know we really um, uh, have confidence in them. That's what I've got to share. Uh, thanks. Mm. Thank you, Stu. Thank you. Um, are there questions on the floor, or is there anything that the, the panel is hearing between the, the presentations that uh, we should be exploring a little here? I mean, we've got just a few minutes. Um, there, there was um, there are several questions within the chat box. One that particularly drew my attention was, you know, any thoughts about restoring broken trust between clergy and congregations? Takes time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I uh, think uh, I'd like to pick up on something that David said earlier. I think, David, what you were describing with regards to um, to a language is um, very well described. What I was alluding to with regards to the development of a language for us to, to use as the church as we move into uh, really addressing some of these situations that are so debilitating to not only the clergy but the lay people as well. An insight that I, in listening that, that, that I've been able to sort of pick up on is how um, people sort of stay out of the conversation when in reality, which creates a vacuum, which might create some of this tension when, uh, you know, if you had ladies sort of entering into the role of saying, well, this is not behavior that we're going to tolerate, and, and the priest is willing to risk a little bit and say, well, this is not behavior I'm going to tolerate, and, you know, and so and, and maybe the diocese is saying, well, you know, we need to stay the course here. Um, but maybe the, when the three poles come in a little bit stronger, um, some of the, the vacuum begins to dissipate, and, and maybe the conflict gets, uh, you know, put down. I mean, I'm just hearing it's been amazing to hear all these things. Uh, I certainly don't want to miss any questions that are out there. I mean, I think part of part of the, the 
long-term work we have as a church to do with both clergy and laity is developing muscles that are about, um, they, they run counter to our, our spirituality that is not always helpful, which is a sheep spirituality. Right. You know, we don't have to be sheep. But we often reward uh, the bad behavior, whether the bad behavior is the, the, the people in the congregation or the clergy. And if someone gets reinforcement by fomenting conflict or being a clergy killer or a bully, uh, that's going to encourage other people to do the same thing. And David, you kind of made, made reference to that. And, and so at some point, we have to stop the bad behavior Right. And then deal with the underlying issue of what's causing the bad behavior or moving to reconciliation or whatever that next step is. Uh, but, but, but meanwhile, we, 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 you go, go back to this issue of ignoring the elephant in the room or pretending it's going to go away rather than saying, stop it. <laughs> right. you know, that is not healthy behavior for you or the community. We're going to stop it. And then, and then you kind of, you kind of regroup, and then you go back to, okay, let's let's look at these underlying issues. Uh, and and we don't do that. We don't do that. We do that in those situations where we find, you know, back to the kind of the, the moral misconduct or the financial misconduct. But we don't do it when it's when it's these, you know, these under undercurrent types of things that we know. Back to, you know, Bonnie's issue of. What are some of the telltale signs? And, and we know it's going to happen, uh, but we look the other way and we'll say, oh, well, that's the way. But we know that's the way she always acts. Let's just ignore it right. rather than saying stop it. Right. Well, this is, I, I'm, not, I'm noting the time, and I imagine Miguel is also noting the time. Um, just fascinating. I, I want to thank everyone. We, again, we, didn't, we know that we want to solve the issue because it's, it's bigger than that, but um, we're, I think we're casting light on it, and, and I hope... Uh, you know, some great insight might come and maybe some future ministry might result. Um, ECF, and we appreciate, NECA appreciates uh, this partnership um, to, to be here and to the board of the, ne the network uh, of Episcopal Associations. I'd like to thank all who signed up, the panel, uh, all the writers, and especially ECF for partnering with us to support this webinar. Um, I couldn't get away with, without a plug. So, um, to, you know, to read the original 11 essays referenced or to explore a beginning set of resources uh, that seek to address challenging calls, please go uh, to EpiscopalClergy.org um, and look under the, the Community Forum tab. Um, we are doing some work to try and do some advocacy, but uh, with that, um, you know, again, thank you and, and, and back to you, Miguel. And uh, thank you very much, Scott. Um, it's simply to say thank you again to everyone who signed up and participated in tonight's event. Thank you for taking your time, and we hope this was helpful. The only additional piece of information is that uh, we send out surveys. You should have one in your in inbox already. Uh, and we'd love to hear back from you about how helpful this panel was um, so that we can continue to do this sort of work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Blessings. Bye. <laughs>